Kind of Murdery is sponsored by HellaDoge.com. That's H-E-L-L-A-D-O-G-E.com. The only social media website that pays 80% of its profits out to real users in real Dogecoin just for doing what you do anyway. It's a blast on there, guys. Get out of the Facebook game. Get into the crypto game. HellaDoge.com. Warning. Kind of Murdery contains adult themes, explicit language, and descriptions of violence. It is not suitable for anyone, and we recommend you stop listening now. California's rugged and scenic northwestern corner is the beginning of the Great Pacific Northwest. Of the Great Pacific Northwest. A region of untamed and primitive beauty. Sheriff's Department has now joined efforts with Illegal the Arcata Police. Growers and living and off the grid. Humboldt yeah. County also has the highest rate of missing person cases in the epicenter of the American economy. There's a lot of evil here. A lot of evil. <laughs> this is kind of murdery, and you're entering the Emerald Triangle. Wow, that was nuts. <laughs> hey everybody, welcome to Kind of Murdery. I'm your host, Zevin Odelberg. Thank you for deciding to be here. Today, we bring you a story from the city of Ukiah in Mendocino County. It's the story of a horrifying and seemingly inexplicable murder of a teenage bride in 1919. And as is often the case, when the explanations of the inexplicable are unearthed, we're left with truths that we can't help but feel would have been better left buried. But before we get into that, first, a word about Mendocino County. There's no question that each of the Emerald Triangle's counties, Mendocino, Humboldt, and Trinity, have played host to their fair share of kind of murdery happenings in the nearly 200 years since Jedediah Smith became the first person of European descent to explore California's northern reaches. And while no shortage of ghouls have disgraced the grounds of Humboldt and Trinity with ghastly deeds over the years, there is also, in my mind, no question that Mendocino County has been home to more than its share of the Emerald Triangle's most depraved, twisted, and grotesque true crime stories. Whether that's simply because it's the Emerald Triangle sibling in closest proximity to a major urban center, where the mathematical odds of leeching sickos into the state's northern reaches becomes far higher, or whether there is another, more esoteric and creepier reason, who's to say? But over just the last 50 years, Mendocino County has attracted the likes of the Moonies, Kenneth Parnell, Lewis Treefrog Johnson, Jim Jones, Leonard Lake, Charles Ng, and Charles Manson. Now, some of these monstrous names I suspect you're familiar with. Others may be unfamiliar. And if they are unfamiliar, then I suggest not Googling them. Whichever path you choose, I think you'll agree with me that Mendocino County is at the heart of the Emerald Triangle's most chilling brand of weird darkness. And it's no mistake that I chose those exact words, because here with me today, is the fiendish father of felonious folklore, the Duke of Dread and all things dastardly, a preacher of creatures and paranormal fright. It's the modern master of the macabre, Darren Marler from Weird Darkness Podcast. Hey, Darren, how you doing today? Dude, I have got to get a copy of that. <laughs> You got to send me that in print, and I'm actually I'm going to take a recording of this, and I'm going to start playing it at the at the beginning of my show. That was <laughs> best intro ever. Thank, oh, you, thank man. you so much for being here. I I can't tell you how excited I am. You know, I'm a big fan of your show. It occurred to me yesterday that you must have a lot of fans who are long haul truck drivers. Yes, yes, I bet you do it. I'll tell you how I figured this out. I was stuck in traffic yesterday. I live in Southern California in San Diego. I was stuck in traffic for about two hours on a drive that should have taken about 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. And I put on Weird Darkness, and all of a sudden, I didn't care that I was stuck in traffic, and all of a sudden, <laughs> I had listened to a couple episodes in a row, and now I'm uh, totally obsessed with Wendigo psychosis. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> Wendigo psychosis is something I never even knew existed. 
until until I started doing Weird Darkness. And it was a really interesting topic. If anybody is not familiar, Wendigo psychosis is the idea that, and correct me if I've got this wrong, Darren, that once you have consumed human flesh, a person then gains a ravenous hunger for human flesh that essentially can never be sated. And it's an mm -hmm. idea that comes out of Native American cultures. That Do I have that right? Yeah, um, I think uh, an another addition to that is when somebody does that, especially if they're familiar with the Wendigo legends, that if they do consume human flesh, they feel like they are becoming a Wendigo. It's almost like like internally in their mind, they actually have become that monster. Uh, whether or not the monster is real or not, that's that's a completely different topic. But it, you know, with the when it comes to Wendigo psychosis that person believes well kind of like the same idea that some people like lycanthropy it was it was originally somebody felt that they were becoming a werewolf not that they actually were one but wendigo psychosis just sounds so cool it does it totally does well shall we jump into today's story oh that's right we actually have a show to do I, I, i've already forgotten about that <laughs> for this story i'm taking you to the town of ukiah now, Ukiah is a town we've been to before, in Kinda Murdery Insomniac, the Ukiah Strangler, and peripherally in our stories earlier this season about the town of Fort Bragg. As the largest town and county seat, the 16,000-person city of Ukiah is likely to pop up in any murder story about Mendocino. And, as I alluded to at the top, Mendocino County is a kind of vortex in the Emerald Triangle that seems to generate or at least attract some of the Triangle's most bizarre and horrifying stories. And so, we find ourselves here again. Ukiah is situated about 115 miles north of San Francisco on Highway 101 near the Russian River. The town saw its biggest population boom alongside the surging redwood timber industry in the 1940s. But today's story begins decades before, in 1919. This is the story of the stomach-churning murder of Frida Beckley, recently become Frida Nash. Frida Beckley was born and raised in Ukiah, dark-haired, dark-eyed, a beautiful young woman with a sharp mind who loved fashionable hats and dresses. In April of 1919, at the age of just 18, Frida Beckley married German-American World War I veteran and recently naturalized citizen the blonde, blue-eyed, and muscular peach farmer, Herman Nash. And so she was no longer legally Frida Beckley, but rather Frida Nash, barely three months later, early in the afternoon of July 9, 1919, still only 18 in the early bloom of her womanhood. Newlywed Frida Nash was found dead in her home by her husband Herman, and immediately thereafter, upon Herman's beckoning, by an electrician named Mr. Foster, who had come to the peach farm to fix a water pump. Frida's body had been horribly mutilated by two shotgun blasts from a double-barreled 12-gauge that belonged to Herman. That, that's, that's, that's a tough one. I got the mental picture on that one. I, I know I did too, unfortunately. My apologies to, to our listeners. Well, you went from early bloom of her womanhood to two shotgun blasts. That's... That's quite the segue. It, it is a bit of a jarring juxtaposition, isn't it? Yeah. The first blast of buckshot had eviscerated her intestines. The second had very nearly blown her head clean off. The coroner said later that the second shotgun blast, the one aimed at her head, could not have been fired from more than four inches away. Ooh. This was made evident by powder burns on Frida's scalp. A heavy soldering iron, like that which might be used by an electrician or a mechanic, was sitting on the bedside table. Both Herman Nash and the electrician reacted with horror and surprise, and Herman, of course, with monumental grief. His beautiful young wife had been horrifically murdered. How? Well, how we know. But how in the larger sense, which leads us to why? Those are the questions we must answer. And to answer those questions, we delve deeper into the stories of Herman and Frida Nash. Sadly, as is often the case, we know far more about the survivor than we do the murdered. And so we will begin 
with the victim's husband, Herman. Whew. Let's just take a little uh, palate cleanser here. That's a, that's a rough start. I that know. is. But, I'm all, but I also am writing this down because I'm stealing this from you for my own podcast. Please, please do. Please do. <laughs> Gosh, again, I would be flattered and... Wow, no, I just, I've, I, for some reason, I've been doing this now for, for six years. I have not heard the Frida and Herman Nash story. I don't know well, how this has not come across, how this has not come across my eyes. This is, this is insanely dark. It, it really is dark. You know, I, I just want to say also, I didn't pick this story only for the gory details. There are some twists and turns and some mystery ahead. So there's more, there's more to it than horror. Um, and sometimes I think what attracts us to horror is the way in which it throws into sharp relief the mm -hmm. more to it, so to speak. Yeah. If it was just a murder and that was the end of the story, there wouldn't, that wouldn't be much of it. But yeah, it's, it's, it's what happens after the murder in so many of these stories. The, the follow-up, the mystery, the investigation, sometimes the, the hauntings, you know, you know that's more, more along my lines. Um, but yeah, it, a, half of the story is what takes place after the death. Absolutely correct. Yeah. So continue on. Yeah. Let's talk about Herman Nash. Herman was born in Germany. So if you'll forgive me the lightheartedness, this is Herman the German we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> he it's was a good serial killer in, name. Why not? It sure is, isn't it? He was born in 1891 when he was a young boy. His father went mad and died in an insane asylum. That bodes well for a young boy. Whew. No kidding. He immigrated to the U.S. and he settled in the Ukiah area at the age of 18 in 1909. He became a naturalized American citizen five years later at 14 years old. And then, when the U.S. joined World War I in 1917, Herman joined the Army perhaps all too aware of his German heritage and eager to prove that he bled the red, white, and blue. You know, that reminds me of a story my grandmother once told me. She worked at the DMV, and she was Italian-American, 100% Italian. Mm -hmm. And when the U.S. entered World War II, and of course the Axis powers were Japan, Germany, and Mussolini in Italy, one day a man walked into the DMV and recognized her, I suppose, by her features as being Italian-American, 100% Italian, mm -hmm. and just started screaming at her that she had no right to be in the country, she ought to get out, she was a filthy, you know, expletive, right. et cetera. And, uh, you know, this is a young woman, but her boss was German. Big German guy. <laughs> And he probably maybe would have done this no matter what his background was, but clearly this particular line of attack struck him acutely as well. And right. he came barreling out of his office immediately in her defense. And so oh, I always cool. thought kindly of whoever that man was. Yes. See, some of some of us Germans are actually okay. Absolutely. Not, not, not very many, but, but a few. <laughs> I have some very close German friends, and not to overly generalize, but every one of them is incredibly on time to the point of early <laughs> it's, it's german precision i'm telling you <laughs> and they're both versions of highly gifted to genius level uh math brains one of them is a musician a virtuoso musician who then taught himself to program and the mm -hmm. other one is a harvard educated landscape architect so Perhaps there's something to those, some of those stereotypes, the positive ones anyway, I can attest yeah. to. Stop uh, buying your watches from Switzerland. That's all, that's all just <laughs> rumor. That's, that, you know, that, that's all just advertising. Get the watches from Germany. Oh, boy. All right, so let's get back to Herman. So he joined I am somewhat military. biased, by the way, with my last name being Marler being German. But then again, I'm sorry, go uh, ahead. I actually, I love, by the way, I love your last name. It's, it's quite evocative. It, it's a... It's a great last name for the show you do and the career that you have. Really? There's, I, I, because, maybe because it rhymes with parlor, but I immediately picture sort of a Edgar Allan Poe-esque, dark, maybe a little bit smoky, um, blood-colored velvet chairs in a, in a Victorian <laughs> parlor when I think of Marler House, which is your production company. So Yes, yeah, Marler House. It works for me. 
Yeah. Well, now I need to build a parlor. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Yeah, that's something else I got to put on my to-do list now. <laughs> oh, sheesh. I apologize. All right. So oh, we sorry, I'm that... sorry. I, I interrupted you. Go ahead. Oh, no, please. Continue please on. Do. Continue on with Herman, the, the, the German. Herman, the German. So he joined the U.S. Army and went to fight in World War I, perhaps to prove his patriotism. And it is intimated although not explicitly stated, that Herman saw heavy fighting in the European trenches and may well have suffered from PTSD. After the war, he returns to Ukiah at the end of 1918 and resumed his previous occupation as a peach farmer. Then, not too many months later, in April of 1919, he married his wife, Frida Beckley, only 18 years old. Herman, at the time, was 28. So not exactly... A winter spring arrangement yeah. but there, there was some big age difference but back them. then actually i don't think it was all that unusual i think you're right yeah herman was square jawed thick and muscular blonde blue-eyed handsome i hate guys like that i know right i mean he looked <laughs> he looked like a. I mean unfortunate and i say this not in a glib way but they have pictures of him in the paper and he looks like an ss recruiting poster i mean he's Ooh. absolutely yeah he's absolutely he like is the Aryan race. Yeah. Yeah. Literally. Uh, Frida was a contrast with dark hair, dark eyes, willowy, thin, beautiful. She loved to wear striking hats and dresses of a style that were not firmly of, but heralded the coming of the flapper look of popular imagination. She had style, class. Yes. Frida could probably even be described as they might have said at the time or a decade or so later as a fashion plate. She was, by all accounts, a healthy, beautiful, quick-witted, and vivacious woman, and the Nashes seemed to be very much in love. The only cloud over their young romance was that Frida was in need of a surgical procedure. It was a surgery that the family doctor assured her was not terribly rare or unusual and posed no real danger to a young woman in good health and vigor. However, the doctor felt that the Nash's domestic happiness could not be assured until Frida underwent the surgery. But we'll return to this later. No, don't do that to me. I need to know what the surgery is. You got me so curious. Oh, you're a jerk. I it's love you, classic, but you're a jerk. <laughs> classic radio tease, right? I mean, come on. I want him to keep listening. Oh, uh, well, okay. So, uh, all right, keep, keep going now. Yeah. Now, I can, right, I, I, now I want you to rush through everything else so we can get to the surgery. <laughs> Oh, boy. Well, speaking of surgeries, from what I know of the medical profession uh, and the evolution thereof, I don't think there was any surgical procedure that posed, quote, no real danger in the year 1919. I was kind um, of thinking the same thing. Yeah, you can go in for tonsils, yeah. tonsillitis, and I mean, you're you're taking your life into your own hands. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they barely stopped using leeches and bleeding people back then. Yeah. <laughs> Now, Derek, have you uh, have you ever told any medical stories on uh, Weird Darkness? We, uh, I'm sure we've had a few. I don't, none of them pop into into my head right now. But uh, anything strange and weird, what can can sometimes creep into the podcast, and a lot of those would be medical issues or um, like so, sometimes sometimes uh, a story where somebody was born unusual and they ended up living like in the freak show circuit for a while or something like that. So yeah, a lot of med medical maladies would definitely yeah. come in. Not necessarily the surgeries themselves, but the maladies. Yeah, medical maladies and surgery are something I'm personally very familiar with. I was uh, born with cerebral palsy, and uh, as a young boy, I used to really walk difficultly i mean i would glibly now compare myself to quasimodo or something mm -hmm. but then when i was seven i had my first surgery and then when i was 12 and again when i was 17 i had my entire left leg rebuilt from the hip to the toe so now i walk pretty normally i might look like i took a bullet in the hip or something i definitely limp a little bit You'll but limp, i'm yeah. i'm thankfully present as pretty pretty uh physically normal human but, I mean, I I have so much sympathy for being born with difficulties and also right. just for the pain and recovery process that's inherent to surgery, even in the modern age. So do you tell so, people that you were born with MS, or do you tell them that you were shot in the hip? Oh, well, actually, it's cerebral palsy. I'm sorry, cerebral uh, not, palsy. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, um, 
You know, I usually just tell them I was born with cerebral palsy, although it has sometimes occurred to me to make up a more exciting story, some motorcycle stunt rider accident or some right. such thing. But, but actually, telling Pat- people that you were born with cerebral palsy, though, can actually make can make for an inspirational story, though. So, you know, sharing that and, and seeing how far you've come and that, you know, that you're walking fairly normal now and it's nothing to be ashamed of. Um, that's no. pretty cool. Thank you. And and I would say that a big part of my maturation as an adult to the degree that I have matured mm-hmm. has been coming to terms and being willing to admit to myself that things were difficult and that I wasn't just totally normal. Because right. for the longest time, I had a lot of denial about it, which created a ton of anger, et cetera. I'm mm-hmm. getting off track here, but you're, you're no, right. No, actually, but I think you. this is a great, comp- a, a great thing to say, because what's going to happen now is once people hear this this episode, those who have had, or, or excuse me, who have cerebral palsy or they, they have a loved one that has it, they're going to come to you and they're, they're going to thank you for being so open about it and for, you know, for, be, for being someone who's not scared to talk about it. Well, I, I hope that does happen. And something I wanted would want to say to those people too is that there are many gradations of severity of cerebral palsy you mm-hmm. can be like daniel day lewis in my left foot and only be able to move your left foot as where i have only had difficulties with my left foot and leg right. so i'm very aware that my situation even from the beginning was not nearly as severe as what many people face and that i had the good fortune of having the medical care that i needed but at the same time it's easy to be too severe with yourself. And I certainly was constantly saying, don't be such a wuss. Somebody else has it way worse. You're basically normal. How dare you be down in the dumps about it and just kind of beat yourself up for being weak. And so I would also tell everyone, whatever your situation with a disability or other difficulty in your life is, Give yourself the space to allow that thing to be hard and to process it emotionally because it's too easy to fall into a trap where we're our own harshest judges. Excuse me while I get up and applaud that speech. Thank you. Yes, that was that was beautiful and, and so true. We, we talk about uh, depression uh, quite a bit on a weird darkness. Mm. And uh, it's not obviously it's not physically debilitating, but it's still debilitating in some way. And there, and you're right. I mean, if you if you suffer from it, even if it's mild, you know, you you beat yourself up. You think that you're not normal. You think that you're not worthy of, you know, of of being in public with other people. I mean, your mind your mind just plays tricks on you with it. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I, I love that. I love what you said. Allow yourself, um, to allow yourself to be beat up by it. Or, or how, how how exactly did you say that? I loved the way you said it. Did you do you remember? Give yourself space for it to be difficult for you you and um, emotionally process how difficult it is without constantly judging yourself for being weak because somebody else has it worse. Because no matter how bad your situation is, somebody else always has it worse. If that is the yardstick by which you judge yourself, you'll never measure up. And that compounds. Yeah, Give yourself Um, permission for life to be hard. So, yeah, yeah, I love that. I love that. Man, now I'm inspired. Yeah, and Darren, if I may, I have to ask you now, you know, in my life, I've had friends and family members and perhaps even myself at times who have who have dealt with depression. And, mm-hmm. and often people really like things like Swedish death metal. If they're depressed, people find something soothing and calming in 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 that kind of music or art or um, mm-hmm. television or movie. And, and so is that something that you feel drew you to the world of weird darkness is it a coping mechanism for you to some degree if that's something you're willing to talk about uh i don't think it was for me necessarily um i'm in a bit of a unique situation of that in fact that my birthday is the day after halloween so Hmm. growing up i was uh, you know all of my happy times were surrounded by all this dark imagery but i started suffering from depression um when i was a teenager and I did. I definitely found myself drawn more towards music that it was in a minor key. You know, uh, you know, I, I liked wearing black, not to the not to the goth effect of it. Just to, you know, I just kind of liked it. But I have noticed, and I have heard from so many people via email, Facebook messages, whatever, when they listen to my podcast, uh, because we talk about depression. That's I. I truly believe that's one of the reasons that they were drawn to the to to weird darkness. 
is because they automat they already have that that dark tone about them. Um, but they also like it because they feel like they're part of the family. And I mean, I, I call them my weirdo family, because just, just out of, just out of fun because of the weird darkness play on words, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. they like the idea that they are accepted, that they're not alone, that others mm. do suffer the same thing that they do. Um, that's why when you mentioned cerebral palsy, I said, that's, it's, that's, what's going to happen to you. People are going to come to you and they're going to say, Hey, wow, you know, nice to know I'm, I'm listening to somebody that suffers the same thing that I suffer from. And they're going to feel a connection with you. And that's that's what happens with weird darkness as well. People uh, who suffer from depression tend to tend to search for darker content. They're the ones they're more likely to to like the horror movies and stuff like that. And uh, mm. they just when I, I'm wondering, they probably don't even realize that depression might be even pulling them towards those things until they hear about it on weird darkness or somewhere else and they kind of put the two and two together going oh yeah you know what that does kind of explain me and and i wonder i can't help but wonder and i wouldn't want to speak for anyone else but perhaps if your default mental state is one that feels sort of dark and haunted most of the time mm -hmm. maybe immersing yourself in a dark haunted world makes you feel normal yeah <laughs> maybe no, no, maybe about it. There are people, there are people who, um, they, I'll go back to my listeners just because that's what I'm familiar with. When they call themselves weirdos, they actually take that on as their persona. They, they say, you know what? Normal people are boring. I would rather be this way. Um, and it, it yeah, they, they, they definitely, they, it gives them their, gives them permission to, to be different and to almost take pride in it. Um, right. that I'm, I'm not a normal person. I'm not like you. I I've got my own unique, unique faults, my own unique personality, and I'm just the way I am. And you know, if you can't, ha if you can't handle it, well, that's fine because I have all these thousands of other people over here who love me just the way I am. So Absolutely. yeah, I think you're, I think you're right on the nose with that. Absolutely. And, and as to what you said about people hearing this and feeling a connection to my experience or wanting to reach out, let me just say that I certainly hope that you do. If anybody out there has cerebral palsy or has struggled with depression or anything else where you feel like your life has been more of a challenge than it maybe should have been, whatever should means, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Reach out to the show. The email is kindamurdery at gmail.com. We're on all social media platforms at kindamurdery. I, I would love to hear from you. I would love to connect with you. And, and with that, Darren, shall we get back to the tale, the terribly dark tale? Not of the really. Nashes? I'm getting kind of bored with it. Okay. No. <laughs> well, then suck it up, bucko, because okay, here right, we go. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, because we still need to figure out what the heck this surgery thing is that, that poor Frida right. has to go through, and you haven't told us yet. I know, that's you right. Jerk? I haven't. All right, moving on. Yep. So the Nashes had been married about three months when on the morning of July 9th, they drove into town around 8.30 a.m., and Frida visited with some friends for breakfast while Herman took care of some business at the bank. They returned home around 10 and immediately picked crates of peaches, which Herman loaded into the bed of his truck. After they'd finished picking and loading around noon, they had lunch, and then around 1 o'clock, Herman drove the peaches into town to deliver them at the railway station for shipping. He stopped at his in-laws, the Beckleys, for lunch, and then went into town where he ran into the electrician, Mr. Foster, who I mentioned earlier. He told Foster about a water pump that needed rewiring and persuaded Foster to head out to the peach farm right away and begin the job, while Nash made some necessary purchases in town. Foster agreed and left. Nash bought some necessaries, then he went to the confectioner's and bought a box of candy for his new bride. And then on his way home, because it was so hot out, he stopped stripped, and took a swim in the Russian River. Nash went home with his supplies and his box of candy for Frida. He arrived at the farm to find Mr. Foster working on the water pump. He asked Foster if he had seen Frida. Foster said no. Nash thought that was strange and went into the house, and suddenly, to his shock, found himself following a trail of blood, and at its end he found to his immediate grief and horror the grotesquely shotgun body of his bride, young Frida Nash, until only recently, Beckley. In the immediate aftermath, 
the crime mystified the authorities. What enemy could Frida Nash possibly have? How could she have engendered such hatred? Nash had left his wife alive at 1 p.m. Foster had arrived at 2 p.m. It appeared that Frida had been murdered in that single hour between Herman's departure and Foster's arrival. God, what a nightmare, right? I'm picturing that, try, walking in on that. Um, my heart just sank. If I was to yeah. walk in, and I, I know this this is not Foster's bride that he's walking in to see, but I just, I, I pictured myself walking in and, and finding my wife that way. And Oh my God. I, w- I would be inconsolable. I'd, yeah. I would be I would be out of out of my mind in grief. I don't I don't think yeah. I could even have I don't even know if I have I would have it in me to call nine one one, or I, yeah. I would just I would plop, plop, black out. I'd want to die right then and there. It, that is just horrifying. And the idea that if you had just left twenty minutes earlier, so that you got home twenty minutes earlier, yeah. or if you hadn't swam in the river, or 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 not knowing. Right. The not knowing the margin of time that was the difference between her being okay or not. Or even more heartbreakingly, perhaps, if I hadn't stopped to buy her a box of candy, oh, she might still be Oh, alive. man. Yeah, that would... Ouch. Oh, yeah, you just made it even worse. Yeah. I know, I know. That would be... I, I, can't, I can't think of the right words to even put into that. It's... it's it, it would just oof. be so devastating. The shot and Freud of it is horrid, right? Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So, anyway... Back to the story. Uh, and everyone, thank you for sticking with us. And I'm sorry to be leading you through this maze of broken glass, rusty metal, and, and terrible emotion. Oh, but don't fool yourself. That's the reason are. people tune into you. You know that. <laughs> it's the, it is the reason. I, I Probably it's the reason in some ways that I do the show. The, the fascination of, I don't know. It's not that I would ever want somebody to be hurt, of course. But there's a... The heightened emotional state and the slow motion car wreck of it all and the mm-hmm. bizarrity of it all. There's just something that it's hard to look away from these tales. They feel so imbued with human stakes because they are. Right. And that makes them so compelling. Yeah. So she apparently died in that one hour between when he left and when Foster arrived. Now, the Mendocino Hospital for the Criminally Insane the Arkham Asylum of Northern California, where the most dangerous of all unstable criminals were sent, was situated not far from the house. Sheriff Byrne of Ukiah thought of the mental hospital first, and he called there to see if any deranged homicidal maniacs had escaped. And let me just say, while that seems like a convenient conclusion to jump to, Mm -hmm. I've also found somewhat to my surprise as I research these historical stories, that prison breaks and asylum breaks were incredibly common in the pre-constant electronic surveillance era. And in fact, I've told stories on this show of people escaping from this exact mental hospital. So Sheriff Byrne may have been on to something. But all the inmates were accounted for. The sheriff was stumped. He had a body and a murder weapon but no known motive and very little opportunity around which to narrow down a list of suspects. Because of the nature of the murder, and in hope of finding clues to solve it, the autopsy on Frida Nash was performed almost immediately, that very afternoon and evening. And after the coroner had cleaned and disrobed the body, he had barely begun the routine phases of his initial examination, when he reacted with such startled surprise that it was remarked upon by attending staff. Now, the coroner was a grizzled veteran of Mendocino murder, and no one had seen a reaction like this from him before. Was she sexually assaulted, doctor? One of them asked. No, said the coroner, his eyes wide. It was at about 7 p.m. that night when the coroner called Sheriff Byrne, and Byrne finally thought he discovered a motive. Ooh, I got the gooseies. <laughs> You're so good at holding off on, on giving us the info. 
I'm 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 trying it. I'm in my head. I'm spinning through. Okay, what could it what could it have been? Was she pregnant? I mean, you, you think well, the autopsy is kind of pointless. You know how she died. I mean, it's very obvious when you walk in and and find her that way. So what on earth could he have found that would give him that kind of a shock? Right. Well, I wondered the same thing. So the Nashes, they had a whirlwind courtship. They met at church and were married before even two weeks had passed. And they'd only been married three months when the murder occurred. And now, Byrne thought he knew who the killer was. The next morning, he called Herman Nash and asked him to come down to the station, telling him he had a fresh lead that might help him capture the fiend who had slain his wife. Between the coroner's call and Herman's arrival at the station, Sheriff Byrne visited the town photographer and had him blow up two photos as large as possible, almost poster size. One of them was of beautiful Frida Nash on her wedding day. The other was of her shotgun mutilated body on the bed. Nash arrived eager to know the clue. What was it? Who'd done it? But he was not met by Sheriff Byrne. He was met by a deputy, and then left in a waiting room for three hours. That never bodes well. It does you're not. A sus- if, if you're in the in the waiting room for three hours, you're a suspect. If they're letting you sweat like that, yes, yeah. indeed, I think you're correct. So the sheriff finally comes in, and Nash says, What was it? Who was it? What is it? Who killed her? And the sheriff takes Nash by the elbow and says, I have the evidence in this room, and he ushers him into the adjoining room, and when he walks into the room, what is displayed there on the wall But the two photos of his wife, Frida in her wedding dress and Frida's terribly mutilated body. And he stops, stunned, horrified. And the sheriff says, I know who killed Frida Nash. And Nash says, who was it? Why do you have these pictures here? This is awful. And the sheriff says, it was you, Herman. It was you. And Herman said, what? Why? Why? Why would I kill my own wife? The sheriff said, she was your wife in name only. Your marriage had not been consummated. In fact, it could not be consummated. When told this, Herman reacted in a new way. Startled, frightened, yes, but also deeply ashamed, as though a dark family secret had been revealed to the entire town. You see... Can I guess? You may. Frida was actually Fred? Mm. I'm just trying to think of something. Okay, continue. It, it, it wasn't consummated. I mean, it it, mm. it shocked the auto. You know, shocked the, uh, you know, the the doctor. I'm just trying. I'm trying to figure yeah. out what on earth would that have been. So if, if she was secretly a, a boy this entire time, and of course they couldn't have consummated the marriage. You know, so right. And then I think our modern psychology leaps to perhaps Herman himself was incapable. How would the coroner know, have known that aspect of it? Right. Though? So, right. I'm going to tell you now. And- okay. Buckle up, guys, because this is all of this is so terribly sad. But you see, Frida Nash had a medical condition known as imperforate hymen. Her vaginal opening was covered by skin. This was the condition that her family doctor called not terribly rare or dangerous, but that needed to be surgically corrected. When confronted with this truth, Herman Nash immediately confessed, saying, I realized my wife's physical condition was not what it should be, but that a slight operation would have remedied this. The thought of this fact, though, caused me to lose control of myself, and I became a madman. My father died in the asylum. Perhaps I am insane, too. And then he told the real account of the events that day. After they had picked and packed the peaches... Frida and Herman went back into the house, and where Herman's shotgun was sitting on a table in a sunroom, and he took note of how his wife seemed to be so terribly frightened of the thing. This is essentially paraphrasing his own words now. Right. And he was suddenly seized with the overwhelming desire to murder her. Just out of the blue. Out of the blue. This is what he says in his confession, although he also says that he was so obsessed with her imperfection. Such a minor imperfection. A- and Something that we still easily then. fixed in, in surgery. Horrible and absurd. And I know, trying to like... get into the head of a, of a killer, I mean, it's already 
you know, hard to do. All, anyway, all I but. can think is that like a true sociopath kind of Patrick yeah. Bateman style that yeah. he took it as some sort of affront to his own pride that she would have that imperfection. Like he, like he can't be a man because she has that imperfection or something. Right, and it's her fault. And now he married this this broken person. Um, well, and I think he was right. I think maybe he was mad, just like his father. Yes, absolutely. Wow, absolutely. Okay, so all right, so so he just he was he was caught up with this 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 obsession idea that he he immediately he he had he had to murder his wife that he he immediately just had this thought that he had to kill his wife. Yeah, there's a very famous Nathaniel Hawthorne story called I believe the Birthmark about a man who has the most beautiful wife in the world. But she has this one little sort of foot-shaped red birthmark on her face, very small, smaller than a dime. And he becomes so obsessed with it that he essentially teaches himself undiscovered medicine and alchemy and all kinds of things until he finally finds a way to remove this birthmark from his wife's face and make her literally perfect, mm -hmm. at which point she dies because... Without imperfection, we cannot be human. Is the is the message of the story? Yeah, and it seems that Herman's dark obsession was along some similar line. So that day, after they had packed the peaches, he went into the house, and she was. He could see her nervous around the shotgun, and he was seized with this overwhelming desire to murder her. And so, he picked up the shotgun, and he fired the first shot, the one that eviscerated her guts, and essentially blew her back onto the bed. Mm -hmm. But then she was not dead. She was moaning. And his thought was to use the other barrel of the shotgun to end his own life. But here he had failed to kill her. So he took that heavy soldering iron that was found at the scene. And his plan was to finish her off by bashing her brains in and then using that other barrel on himself. But he lost his nerve. And so... From very close range, because he had approached to hit her with the soldering iron, he fired that other barrel, as has been described. And then, careful not to be covered in blood, he packed everything up and drove into town to deliver the peaches. Ran into Mr. Foster, sent Foster out to the farm to create an alibi for himself. Also, went to buy the candy to create an an alibi for himself uh -huh. because people would assume that you don't buy candy for a dead person. Right. And then, and this is my presumption, went for a swim so that he had an excuse to have changed his clothes. So he confesses to all of this in written confession only to recant the very next day and say that he was innocent and that he had been coerced by the sheriff who was concerned that he would be lynched by a town that was outraged and so basically just wanted to tie up the case in a neat little drawstring. And so he said, I should never have confessed to that. It's not true. I don't know who killed my wife, but it wasn't me. Never mind the fact that his confession explained every single detail of the scene. Correct. Yeah. It's kind of hard to be coerced into a confession and still be that accurate as to what exactly happened. Right, I was coerced into a confession that revealed details that only the killer would Yeah, know. yeah. Because that happens all the time. Nevertheless, he pleads not guilty and he goes to trial, where, thankfully, his bloody fingerprint is discovered by alienists, which is what they called the CSI people back then. Mm -hmm. His bloody fingerprint is found on the handle of the shotgun, and he is convicted, and he is sent to prison for life but notably not without the possibility of parole. He's sent to San Quentin. He's first eligible for parole in 1926 after serving seven years. Parole is denied. Again, in 1932, he goes before the parole board and begs for his release. Again, denied. Good to hear. Yeah, few, right? Well, in the meantime, he had become a mail clerk in the prison. And he also cared for the warden's dog and parakeet. He was generally well-liked by other prisoners and the staff. Essentially the model prisoner. Not just good behavior, exemplary behavior. He made himself almost indispensable with his clerking skills in the mailroom. So in 1936, he goes before the parole board again, 16 years after the murder. This time, parole is granted. This causes a giant 
uproar, especially in Northern California. People are like, how is it possible this confessed, although recanted, murderer of his beautiful young wife is out on parole? Uh, He was 28 when he did it. So 17 years later, 16 years later, he's only 44. Right. He's a man still in his prime. Well, how can he possibly be out? Well, now this is a little interesting. It was standard procedure then, and I don't actually know if parole boards still do this, but when a prisoner comes up for parole, letters are sent to the judge and the district attorney who tried him and to the leaders of the community in which they committed the crime Mm -hmm. to take the temperature of those people and get their opinion on whether or not they believe the prisoner should be released and how they would feel about the prisoner being released and possibly even being reintegrated into their community. Well, as you can imagine, the people of Ukiah, the good people of Ukiah, were and remained horrified by this monster Herman Nash and would never have written anything but hell no in response to those letters. However, the insidious, devious Herman Nash had made himself the mail clerk. Well, there is this massive uproar over his pending release that certainly throughout California, all the major papers, the Chronicle, what have you, the Los Angeles Times, and it's a semi-national uproar. This becomes a national story. It is discovered that the parole board granted his release in absence of any objection from the community of Ukiah, from the judge, from the DA, and the reason there was no objection is that those letters never went out. So Herman, he wasn't so he was not the mail clerk of the pris of the prison. He was no, the he mail was. clerk of the entire town. He was the mail clerk of the prison. The parole board and the warden of the prison were go- were sending out the letters to the town of Ukiah right. to to ensure that oh, to find out if Ukiah objected to his release. So the notification he, of his of his parole coming up correct was never correct. Oh wow. He intercepted the letters. They never left the prison. Nobody found out that he was going to be paroled until essentially the day before his release. And initially, everyone thought this was some bizarre secret deal that he made with the warden for God knows what kind of hideous favors. But there is such an outcry that Governor Merriman, the governor of California at the time, revokes Herman Nash's parole, overrules the parole board, which was the first time that anybody was aware of that this had been done by a governor. Mm -hmm. And he is applauded for it. Well, Herman goes back into prison, and then he sues the prison system. (laughs) Jeez. On the grounds that other men had been convicted of life in prison, served far less time than him with good behavior. He'd been in prison for 17 years now, Mm -hmm. and then been paroled. So he essentially said, what legal grounds, what comparable cases do you have to support the idea that my parole should be overturned? It's not fair that I have to stay in here. Yeah, exactly. Wow. So in 1937, his appeal goes to the state Supreme Court and he wins. Unbelievable. He is given a writ of habeas corpus and released. But now he has literally nowhere to go because in the meantime, the United States government has revoked his citizenship. He was a naturalized citizen, not a born citizen. Mm. They said, in light of your crimes, you are no longer a U.S. citizen. The U.S. won't take him. They offer him to Argentina and Venezuela, who both indignantly, understandably indignantly refuse. Say, no, we'd rather not have him. Thank you very much. But because of his consummate clerking skills... He's offered a job as a shipping clerk in the Philippines by a wealthy San Francisco businessman. And the Philippines, seeing that he has employment, Mm -hmm. I guess, agree to take him. And so, 18 years after murdering his wife in one of the most horrific ways and for one of the most horrific reasons possible, Herman Nash sails for a new life in the Philippines at the age of 45, never to be heard from again wow that is a disturbing story 
I know, and it doesn't even have the ending that you want. No, at first it you're like, "Good, he goes to prison for life. Good, he never gets out." And then you're yeah, like, Wait or somebody else what? kills him, or or some bad karma comes on him, and he ends up dying in a car accident or something. Right. We don't even get no. that. We have we get zero closure on this. And, and some would probably say that I shouldn't even have told this story for that reason. That it's probably frustrating for everyone hearing it, as frustrating as it is for me and for you. But I can't help but have been fascinated by the maze of details and the improbability of the outcomes. And so yeah. if anyone is angry at me for telling the story, you have a right to be, but uh, there it is. <laughs> you're listening That's to the wrong podcast. Kind of and if, if, there, if you're angry yeah. with, with Zevin for, for telling this story, then why are you here listening? <laughs> there you go. You are it on is the wrong... Called... It, I mean, it is called, you know, murdery, you know, for right, a reason, yeah. you know. Yeah, exactly. And I do say at the top, this show is not appropriate for anyone. Turn it off. And I do mean that. Yeah. So, Although you've gone past kind of on this one. It's not kind of murdery in this one. This is full-blown murdery on, on this it episode. Is. Wow. that I, I'm, I'm kind of curious as to what the guy in the Philippines was thinking, that he'd actually want to hire this guy to work for him. You're essentially just saying, you know what? I know you're an evil son of a mother. But I'm going to go ahead and bring you on anyway because I need a mail clerk. Right. That's right. it. No, I absolutely. And in addition, not that he should have gotten out in this case, but I feel like the intensity of my feelings about him would have been somewhat affected had he stuck to his confession and his grief mm -hmm. and his explanation that that madness runs in the family. Take responsibility for it. But yeah. the, exactly. But the fact that he recanted the confession, was convicted, then conspired or did withhold parole documents to try to nefariously get paroled against the community's wishes. I mean, he was absolutely self-interested and calculating from no the remorse first to whatsoever. the last. Man, I can't believe we don't have a, a, a follow up on what happened to him. That, I'm sorry. That I know. sucks. I, it does. Yeah, I can't help the conspiracy theorist in me can't help but wonder if there really was a wealthy San Francisco businessman or if clandestine services of the United States made a backroom deal with the Philippines just because they had to send this guy somewhere and that that was the explanation that they gave the public. Like maybe he ended up going in, going behind bars in the Philippines or something just secretly. Hopefully, or maybe he was just sent to the Philippines. But to your point, it's hard for me to imagine any person of good conscience right. hiring this guy. I mean, knowing the story. Then again, we're looking at looking on this hindsight with everything. I mean, yeah. so at, at the time, you never know how much information they truly had about this guy. But wow, what a what a right. horrible ending, Zevin. I know. I know. I'm sorry. And. I think the fear that all of us might have, if in fact Herman was right and his madness was genetic, that there would be now a bunch of descendants of Herman Nash running around the Philippine Islands horrifically murdering people. Um, yeah, if, yeah, if it's if it's genetic. Oh, that's oh, that's a great thing to think of. Gee, I'm, like, well, it was we, it was bad enough to not have an ending. Now you've created a worse ending. Now I've created the horror movie. Yes, the Nashlings. <laughs> Then, yeah, oh, it's, you, you've got Texas ah! Chainsaw Massacre in the Philippines now. I uh, Wow. Okay. Whew. Well, I'm, my day is ruined. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah you're, you're, well, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Oh. Oh. I thought I'm going to have to go take a nap out of this, uh, after this. This was exhausting. What a story. Yeah. Well, I hope it was somehow emotionally cathartic and not an entirely awful way for everyone. Often, if you've listened to the back catalog of the show, often I intentionally pick stories that are not so dark and have humorous elements. They might be a robbery or a justifiable homicide or something where it's not so heavy and dark. Right. I, I do usually go out of my way to go down a path more similar to that, or at least to have the victim be someone who in sort of a horror movie seven sins sense kind of deserved it. They mm -hmm. were a criminal of their themselves or, or something. Uh, I, I usually avoid innocent people 
especially innocent women and especially sex crimes I, for a reason, because it is so heavy to go through. In this case, when I found this story, I just found it to be so fascinating because of the, the details that were available that I, I couldn't turn away from it for better or worse. I have to admit, if I had come across it, I probably would have included it in Weird Darkness, too. It is such a fascinating story. Even if it doesn't have a happy... Well, then again, I mean, the kind of podcasts that you and I do, they are very rarely happy endings. That's uh, true. But, uh, yeah, this was just so dark and so twisted. Mm -hmm. And I feel so awful for Frida. Um, I, 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 I tell so many stories of serial killers and and uh, killings and stuff like that, and you feel bad for those victims. But I, I for some reason, I am just attached here to to poor Frida. I mean, she she had she had done nothing, and, and such a whiplash from young love, yeah, from meeting and falling head over heels so quickly that you're married within two weeks, and and bliss, and that I found my person. Yeah. Such a whiplash to to a mere. A mere three months later, murdered in your own home. Yeah, for for something that that you were were born with, and you know, circling back to our talking about cerebral palsy and depression, I, I think that often, certainly, I speak for myself when I say that people with disabilities, even if they're more minor, mm -hmm. live with an ever present fear that they will be rejected because of them. You can't sure. force someone to fall in love with you. You can't force them to date you. You can't blame a person if they don't have chemistry with you. You live with a fear of rejection for something that's not your fault and that you were born with and that you can't do anything about. And I think maybe that, maybe that though, is what drew me to this story. Maybe it is the knowledge of that fear of rejection for something that you can't control and can't necessarily fix. But may, maybe, maybe that's why. I, I think you're right about that. I think we, we all have something in us that we don't want to share with others, something that we are ashamed of. Um, there's, there's, there's some part of me that I don't want others to know about, and so I'm not going to be open about it. And mm -hmm. I'm sure that there are, there are things that we even keep from those that we love the most um, just because we, we don't like the idea about them in ourselves. And mm -hmm. so I can, I can understand Frida not doing that and I mean, she probably, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if she suffered from depression because of that. Uh, oh, yeah. I well, mean, and 18 how... is so young. She's a, she now is a man in my 40s. I thought I was all grown up at 18, but 18 year olds are children. I mean, oh, yeah. when I see high school kids these days, it's, I say to my wife, is that person like 11 or 12? And she'll be like, oh, no, that's, she's 16 or 18 or something. And I'm like, no way. I know. She's like 10 years old. That's why whenever these gross, Men that say like, oh, I met her in a 21 and over bar. I thought she was old enough. No, you didn't. Once you're 40 years old, the 18 year olds look like they're 12. I, I don't, agree. I don't, I don't believe you. And, and I think that she's so innocent and so young and to expect her to know how to grapple with the powerful emotions of falling in love and the fear of preemptively revealing this is it's too much it's too much to ask of a young person a hundred years ago is what we're talking about right try try talking about sex and intimacy back then and then right. add add on to that the fact that you have an intimacy issue i don't i mean who do you even go to for that aside from the aside from the doctors i mean can you go to a psychologist for that to get you through it i don't think they would have that back then I'm, no, I think, uh, you know, I think Dr. Freud was still prescribing cocaine to people. Yeah. Uh, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. No, that, there's that might not have actually been recourse. beneficial for Herman. Yeah, he, he could use <laughs> that. This, right. this was awesome, man. This, I, right. I really appreciate you having me on today. This this was, I'm not going to say exciting, because that's that, that's the wrong word to use. It, it was a privilege being here, but um, it was all draining. It is draining. I have that feeling too, that kind of like just walked out of a three hour action movie feeling in, when you mm -hmm. go to the matinee and you walk out and it's too bright and you're like, ah, oh. yeah. but, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, but no, really thank you so much for being here, Darren. I mean, so exciting for me, such an honor. I'm a fan of your show. You're a consummate professional. I mean, you're also just guys, Darren. In person, in, in regular Darren, not just the voice you hear on Weird Darkness, 
is really one of the kindest people I've met and, and so fun to be around. So please, if you don't already, and you probably do, listen to Weird Darkness, leave a five-star review, email Darren, go to WeirdDarkness.com, interact engage it's a beautiful community that darren has built he talked about it a little bit today the stories are utterly compelling once you turn it on you won't turn it off you'll just keep listening so please subscribe to weird darkness podcast it's a wonderful place to be and i'm so happy that darren chose to be here with me today i had um i had a great time you know, as as dark as the as the content is, I really enjoyed the conversation, man. I really appreciate it. I'll, I can't wait to tell my own weirdo family um, of listeners about kind of murdery, and uh, this is a great way to introduce them to what you're doing. I'll say, hey, you know, you guys need to check out this this conversation I had with Zevin. It was a really great, and you're gonna love his podcast. So thank you. And for Darren Marler from Weird Darkness Podcast, I'm Zevin Odelberg, and this has been kind of murdery. Kind of Murdery, the Emerald Triangle, is created, researched, edited, produced, and hosted by Zevin Odelberg, with opening theme by Niall Madden, and art by the Gin of Lang. Available now on all podcasting platforms. If you like the show, please subscribe, review, and tell your friends. You can find us on social media at Kinda Murdery or email at kindamurdery at gmail.com.